Thanks for staying with us here on The Pulse. So other stories now. The scientific community in Ghana is sharply divided over the proposed use of nano-liquid technology to restore the country's heavily polluted rivers caused by illegal mining activities. The chief executive officer of the Environmental Protection Authority, Professor Nana Ama brown Kluche, revealed on the probe over the weekend that government is considering nano-liquid, among other technologies, to clean up the contaminated water bodies. Well, we'll hear from her shortly. But first, let's listen to Dr. Ekpo, who is against this whole strategy. According to him, it's not even achievable. Listen. Please, we should stop using the technology, uh, de-chemicalizing. Uh, that is wrong. Huh? It is completely unscientific. How can you de-chemicalize water? A river. How can you de-chemicalize food or water in this country? Which, which body of science can de-chemicalize de water? I, I was sad. To tell you the truth, when I was listening to people who were supposed to... But they said that was dechemicalization is doable ex except it is Look, expensive. It's preposterous. H2O, water itself is a chemical. The uh, beneficial chemicals in water, there are very important uh, minerals like iron. I'm talking about, if you look at uh, some of the uh, essential minerals that we are supposed to be taking, potassium, so they are all inside. Are you going to remove them? So I was shocked when the EPA director or whoever she was was saying that they would dechemicalize what they are in the procurement process. You're yes, saying we're going, to throw, we're going to throw uh, money yes. away. I'm yes. not going to uh, assume I was going to say what uh, she has done or not. But what it struck me was that she was just talking politics. She's a political appointee. How can you, no, the first point is as a specialist, head of a national institution, how can you open your mouth? How can you open your mouth? The specialist whom the president relies on and takes, no wonder, and takes advice, technical advice from you, come and you stand on a national platform and states that you want to dechemicalize rivers. water, rivers. rivers. It's a shame. Well, that is a conversation that happened on Newsfile. And just on the probe over the weekend, the EPA CEO, Professor Nanama Brown Kluche, rejected Dr. Aka's position, insisting that nano liquid technology remains a viable option under the serious government, under serious government operation and consideration, she says. But then with this, we know that the technology is available. It's proven. Particular application of this technology is also proven. We have seen examples in Greece. You have seen some in the US, in Israel, in Turkey, wherever. But this has been tested in Greece, I have seen for myself. We have done the test in the lab. So the EPA advised the government that this, we have tested, it works, and it's doable. All we need is the financial means to do this procurement. How much is it going to cost the taxpayer? We've seen billions of dollars for the US one. Yes. Have we quantified yet? We, not yet. Okay. But to do a pilot to show to Ghanaians and even the presidents that this is doable, we need 200,000 USD. Well, that's a controversy in that sector as to if exactly we can deploy that technology to purify our river bodies. It's a conversation we'll be having here on The Pulse. Join me shortly would be an environmental communicator, Ama Kudum Ajiman. She will be just breaking down if indeed this is feasible. The concerns being raised by both parties. We've just been hearing from Dr. Aka tell us that there is no such thing as to dechemicalize our river bodies. And then we've been hearing from the EPA boss put on record that it is possible. It has been tried in other communities and countries around the world and it has yielded results and in fact there's a pilot plan that they are launching shortly so we'll just be getting their thoughts on this while this war rages on on the scientific approach to deal with the pollution caused by illegal mining on our water bodies we're just trying to recollect the lines to speak to her and once we have clear connection to her we'll have that conversation here on the pulse well away from that the electricity company of ghana 
and the Ghana Water Company are under intense pressure after three business associations launched a skating attack describing the companies as, quote, leaking baskets, unquote, plaguing the uh, plagued by waste and inefficiency, they say. The association, including the Food and Beverages Association of Ghana, as well as the Ghana Union of Trades Association, Guta, and the Ghana Plastic Manufacturers Association, are petitioning the president to launch an executive reform agenda with that sector within the next 30 days to tackle challenges such as technical and commercial losses, revenue collection, and other operational shortcomings. Well, they want the committee's work anchored on key performance indicators enforced by a presidential tax force. The group also slammed the company's proposed tariff increment for both ECG and the Ghana Water Limited. Listen. I've invited you here to help us make an agent and a clarion call to the President of the Republic of Ghana, His Excellency President John Dramani Mahama, and the NDC government that Ghanaians massively voted for in the last general elections. To immediately let the reset agenda that the His Excellency sold to Ghanaians and which we bought kickstart at the ECG and the water company respectively. We are here by warning that approving new tariffs, hikes for utilities, especially the ECG and the Ghana water company without deep reforms would be a profound injustice to the businesses and households of Ghana. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, the Auditor General's report year after year and data from the Energy Commission of Ghana reveal that ECG in particular is bleeding money through inefficiency, corruption, and waste. How on earth can a company like that ever make profit? How can tariffs ever solve their problems? Every increase in tariffs is like pouring water into a basket. And that is the position of industry. That no matter the amount of tariffs that is put on it, that is increased, it will continue to be like we are pouring water in a basket. That basket will never get full. It will never hold the water. And that is what has happened over the years. Well, Joseph Obing, the president of Guta, also noted that Ghanaian traders struggle to export goods because of the country's high utility rates and warned that the government's 24-hour economy initiative could fail if the utility situation is not addressed. That's important as we, we don't have to continue to increase and increase whilst businesses suffer the way we are suffering. Does not make us competitive at all. At all. Uh, we all realize that we are doing the Afri African continental free trade area, and Ghana is lagging behind. We are not competitive. Our goods cannot even be sold at Togo. It doesn't go beyond the other member states. Why? Because of high cost of doing business here, especially in regards with, with utility charges. It does not help us. And we should know, the earlier we know that set these issues and put it in proper context, we are not going to industrialize or the 24-hour economy that we want to propagate will we'll, we'll just be in a mess. Well, let's take you back to our earlier story. We told you we have having a conversation about government's recent declaration on the approach to purifying our river buddies, the EPA boss, was on the probe over the weekend just telling us how government needs some $200,000 to launch this, you know, trial process on how to purify our water buddies. And I told you that I'll be engaging Ama Kodum Ajiman. She's an environmental communicator. She's also president of the media platform on environment and climate change and a PC member of OFAB Ghana chapter. We appreciate your time here on The Pulse. Uh, we're just hearing from government. Give us your plan, really, on this new nanotechnology they plan to employ to rid our river bodies of all the chemicals that are plaguing our water as a result of illegal mining. From where you sit, is this a viable option? Um, thank you very much um, for getting in touch with me. Um, at the moment, I, I think the country is in a desperate situation. 
and then desperate situations require desperate measures. So I would want to say, I, I, I want to believe that the government is in earnest of how to handle this whole menace. Uh, that, that, I don't even know if the word is money because it's beyond money. Um, what the, the government is seeking to do is right for me because the situation requires not just ordinary measures but also scientific processes to handle it. But the, the, the challenge that I am seeing is that if the source of the problem is not contained, and uh, we, we focus on treating the water and purifying it at the source. What is happening? Because as long as these ones continue to defy the laws of the country and take matters into their own hands, then there is going to be a continuous problem. So that is where the issue is. How do we tackle the source? And people have to propose all kinds of things. Um, including alternative livelihoods and whatever. But you see, these people who are involved, they don't care about alternatives. I, 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 I returned from Mansui Aukum, one of the uh, Galamse notorious areas. And it is sad. When I was returning, I came with a lady who also happens to be, she does Galamse because I asked her, um, sister, do you also do it? She said, yes. All the women now, we all do it. And it's not just about the women, it's even little boys. So once in a while they go out, they, they collect the soil, they, they do whatever they want to do with it, and they get gold, they sell, and they have so much money in their pockets. So to hell with mother, to hell with father, to hell with school, to hell with whatever. So what alternative life are you going to give to such a person? If he's going to get monthly salary, or he has to work, uh, uh, you know, very hard, make money that pays within hours. It, indeed, it is, it is a very, very um, terrible situation we are in as a country. From where you and sit, really, how do you propose government should tackle the illegal mining menace from source? <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it, it, it's overwhelming, seriously. But I believe that it is time for our chiefs. You see, some of our chiefs are very powerful. But um, we have a situation, even though if I mention this, they will come out to deny it. We know that chiefs are involved. How did Chinese get to go into those areas where they are? They went there because they were allowed in there. They did not just get up and go there. So can our chiefs arrive? We were, we were asking the government to declare um, a state of emergency. Can our chief in those areas also arise and declare a state of emergency? Maybe that state of emergency should emanate from our chief, first of all. Because all those lands, yes, uh, minerals are, uh, uh, are held in, run by the, in trust by the government. But then all those areas are two lands. They are two lands. So can our chief arise and also declare a state of emergency? Because once our chiefs arise and declare a state of emergency, the, the people most of the time, they, they respect and honor their chiefs more than our political head. So can our chiefs do something? Can our chiefs really arise and then back the government in this way? Because until do that, I don't know what is going to happen. I, I, I think we do not know because these are the people who do not understand that what we are it's in serious their health, and in about five, ten years to come, maybe not soon after ten years, they will not have anything. Because when you are coming from those areas, formerly food is scattered from there to urban centers like Kumasi. Now they are carrying yam, charcoal, and what was to those areas to sell. Why? So it's baffling. But I believe our chiefs hold the answer. They should arise and also declare a state of emergency in their area. They should. Thank you so much, Madam Mary, for your time here on the poll. She's an environmental communicator, just sharing her thoughts on how best we can deal with this illegal mining menace. Well, let's shift our attention now to the education sector. The Minister for Education, Haruna Idrisu, has directed the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission to immediately assess and address the salary disparities 
between medical doctors in academia and those serving under the Ghana Health Service, describing the situation as an unfair labor practice. He acknowledged the urgent need of correction to ensure equity and fairness in the remuneration structure for public service, service providers. The minister made this revelation after being briefed by the dean of KNUST School of Medical Sciences on the poor conditions of service doctors under the Ministry of Education face compared to their counterparts in the health sector. Here's a report by Clinton Yebois. Students of medical sciences professor Akwesi Enkikusi reviews that the disparity has made it increasingly difficult to attract young doctors to join academia as lecturers and researchers. Part of the unattractiveness to join faculty is because of the disparity in salary between doctors in the Ministry of Health and doctors in academia. So if you are in the Ministry of Health, your salary is up there. If you are in the Ministry of Education, is down there, as the saying goes, for teachers, Akatuyano, Ewasro. Because of this, our young doctors don't want to join the medical school as lecturers. I call on the CEO of the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission to help bridge this gap. The Minister of Education, Haruna Idrisu, in response, has assured that a review from the Fair Wages and Salary Commission will address the disparities. He was speaking at the 50th anniversary Gandeba of the KNUSC School of Medical Sciences. To the Dean of Medical Sciences, he made me appreciate the disparity and salary gaps or conditions of service between doctors in the Ghana Health Service and doctors at the Ministry of Education. So Nana reported me right. I hurriedly and quickly called the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission and I've asked them to evaluate and close the gap and the difference in a manner that is fair and respectful. will count as an unfair labor practice. I came to play with Dr. Sribwa and his other friend, but thanks to him and others, we worked and gave Ghana codified conditions of service for all medical practitioners. Thanks to him. For Joy News, my name is Clinton Yeboah. Well, that's how we wrap up the bulletin here on the Joy News channel. We appreciate your time. My name is Faustina Safa. For more news, please log on to myjoyonline.com. Have a pleasant day as you enjoy the rest of our programs. Bye.